everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jackie Enterline, and I'm the Media and Outreach Manager here at GuideStar. We're excited to have you all join us for the third part in our series on evolving the conversation about nonprofit overhead. Before we begin, I just want to take a few minutes to go over logistics. To submit a question through GoToWebinar, just look in the control panel off to the side of your screen. And there you'll see the questions box. So you can just type your question and send away. Now if you only see the questions header but not the box, select the plus sign to the left to expand it. So we've just sent out a message in that box and you should see it now or a few minutes. Go ahead and submit your questions there. And then finally, you can also submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag OverheadMet. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob Harrell, GuideStar's president and CEO, to kick off the conversation. Great. Thanks so much, Jackie. And welcome, everyone, um, to the third uh, in our series of conversations about nonprofit overhead. Um, I think I'm not alone in this crowd of believing this is a profoundly important conversation um, for the future of the nonprofit sector. So we're really glad you um, joined us. We've had more than 1,000 people um, register for this conversation today. And um, the first two, for those of you who didn't join them, have been really terrific conversations. Um, in, back in October, we had one with folks from Bridgespan and Fast Company Magazine talking about a media and technology perspective on, on the overhead myth. Then in December, we brought in some heavy hitters, the president of the Ford Foundation, the president of Independent Sector, um, to talk about how leaders in the field are really wrestling with this question. Um, but today, we're really going to where the action is, which is on the ground, the folks on the front lines trying to make a difference in their communities, um, and how the overhead myth has been a barrier to them, and what we can do um, to overcome it. Um, and we have some extraordinary folks today. Um, an uh, old friend of mine, Ann Goggins Gregory, who's been a true leader on this issue, author of the seminal article in Stanford Social Innovation Review uh, on the nonprofit starvation cycle. She's a chief operating officer at Habitat for Humanity of Greater San Francisco. We have Dominique Bernardo of Congreso de Latinos Unidos in Philadelphia, um, another um, great thinker on this, uh, this set of, of critical questions, who's really going to be able to make it concrete, I think, for us. Um, and then we have the arguably legendary Vu Le, the executive director of Rainier Valley Corps that many of you may know as uh, potentially the funniest blogger in the nonprofit sector. Um, and if you haven't checked out his blog, nonprofitwithballs.com, I strongly recommend it for some great uh, insight. Um, and I, uh, again, I'm, I'm Jacob Harold, I'm the president and CEO of GuideStart. I'll, I'll offer a few opening remarks. Um, but I want to leave most of the time for our three presenters and then for all of you to ask some questions. Um, so basic quick framing um, is that we all know that the nonprofit sector is an engine for good. It represents the very best parts of the human spirit. And the work that you all do and that the millions of people um, who are engaged in social change as part of the nonprofit sector do every day is far too complex and far too important to be distilled down to um, the financial metrics that one might find on the Form 990. Which is not to say that those metrics are not meaningful, they are, but they do not tell the full story of social change. And we here at GuideStar believe we are in the midst of a profound transition to a new way of communicating the complexity and nuance of nonprofits, um, enabled by technology, but most importantly enabled by a new spirit of openness, um, willingness to share on the part of the nonprofit sector, to help us transcend the old conversation we've had about nonprofits, um, and get to one that's appropriate for the people in the communities and the ecosystems that we're trying to serve, that, um, that we can, I think, follow the lead of Habitat for Humanity in Omaha, Nebraska, um, that in sharing data with GuideStar and with the broader community, has actually gotten to the sort of metrics that really tell the story of the work that they do, um, that begin to allow us to imagine the people who are out of unsafe housing because of the efforts of that organization, true results data, um, 
but framed in the terms that make sense to them, uh, that make sense to the nonprofit, that has better line of sight, better understanding of context um, than we certainly ever could here, uh, here at GuideStar. Um, and more broadly, that as we begin to collect this new level of rich and meaningful data, that we have a potential to really have that flow throughout the entire nonprofit sector. Um, and here at, at GuideStar, we now have Amazon, Facebook, Fidelity, Google, all using GuideStar's data um, as part of their tools. So there's reason to think that we can actually get to a point as a field where this rich data um, is what defines the story of social change and not just um, overly simplistic metrics like the overhead ratio. Now, I know in saying all this that I am most likely preaching to the choir. I know that folks are probably joining this call um, because you have already seen how overhead can be a problematic um, framework. But sometimes it's very valuable to preach to the choir because we as a field need to get aligned on our messages. We need to be equipped with a set of tools and ways of speaking that can help convince donors and government officials and foundation staff to make the shifts that we know are necessary. Um, and the folks that we have who will be presenting today, and Dominique and Vu, um, are themselves so well equipped from their own experiences to really help you, the audience, um, come away, we hope, from this webinar feeling ready to go out and battle the overhead myth um, so that the conversation about social change is actually about social change um, and that we're able to focus, um, again, on the people and the communities and the ecosystems that we serve. So with that, I'm very happy to hand it over to our first speaker, Ann Goggins Gregory. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the warm introduction, Jacob. I've had the opportunity to see this issue from a variety of vantage points over the last 10, 15 years. And before I jump into the Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco perspective, I would just share that I genuinely believe that the conversation is changing on costs and moving away from the overhead ratio. We have a long way to go as a sector to focus, as Jacob said, on social change as opposed to ratios and numbers as, as definitions of effectiveness, though I would say the ratios and numbers can be helpful. I just feel like in the last 10 years there has been a noticeable shift, and I would say in particular in the last three, we see a lot less pie charts or buckets of costs, as I'll talk about in a moment, and more of a holistic perspective on the numbers. That said, as I share the Habitat Greater San Francisco perspective today, I will confess that as I transitioned from the role at BridgeBand to now an operator for a large nonprofit and was faced with managing a lot of this messaging and a lot of this analysis in conjunction with our staff here, I've been really humbled and sobered by how hard it can be to make change internally as well as externally um, in talking with boards and donors, et cetera, it still is hard. In fact, when Jacob asked for me to participate in this webinar, my first comment was, we have not figured this out, and I'm embarrassed to say that we haven't figured it out, but we have made progress. So to the extent I can share progress, that's what I'll do, and uh, I hope that we, um, as a sector, can continue to build on the progress made by myself, um, by you leaders on the phone, and by others. So before I jump in, I will be very brief and just share what it is that Habitat Greater San Francisco is and does. Because Habitat is part of one of the largest networks, I think it's important to note we are a federated model. Habitat Greater San Francisco operates as a separate entity. We have our own board. We raise all of our own money. And we do a couple of primary things. The first is we build homes for homeowners or for aspiring homeowners earning between 40 and 80 percent of area median income. To put that in perspective in the Bay Area, for a family of four, that's between $45,000 and $84,000 per year. We build, uh, most recently, we are closing about 38 homes in our three-county region. 
And as a reminder, this is a home ownership program, so when we sell the homes, the homeowners are paying their mortgage to Habitat fixed at 30% of their income. We also do neighborhood revitalization. So this is a more nascent program for us. We work with primarily aging seniors in our three counties to help them retain their homes. Many of these homeowners have been in their homes 30, 40, 50 years in some cases and are at risk of displacement due to often deferred maintenance. And this is their really only asset that they have to remain in place. And we do all of this working with volunteers. So you'll see in a moment the volunteers, two of them, that do the building, the revitalization work on the ground. We work with about four to 6,000 volunteers a year. So onto the funding model and to dig into what lessons we've learned. So one thing that has been striking as I've transitioned into this organization from other organizations I've worked with is the diversity of the funding sources and mix. Um, from municipal to state subsidies to large philanthropic gifts from foundations as well as individuals. So we have a large portfolio of unrestricted philanthropic gifts. In a lot of ways that gives us a lot more flexibility than I suspect a lot of nonprofit leaders on the phone have. Um, and yet this issue of full cost and overhead cost still can be vexing for us. I think it's important to note the high cost per output. So we're talking about building our units, our homes, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per unit, given the cost of construction in the Bay Area. So that, if you talk about the cost issue that we deal with most frequently, it is that. And then finally, this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's important to note, I, I had mentioned this when we were planning this discussion, that a lot of us still really focus on the ratings agencies like Charity Navigator and while they've changed their methodology in recent years it still is dominated by financial ratios and for us we have a real issue in how that ratio gets calculated and how it reflects in our star ratings. Uh, at the moment we are three star versus four star. Our board cares a lot about this. They talk about it a lot donors sometimes ask about it. And the reason for that, slightly lower than what we'd like rating, if we have to be rated, is that our homes are only con counted in our programmatic spending when we sell them. So given that we're a region when we're, where we are selling, let's say, 38 homes in a year, but then we might be in construction for another 18 months on the next batch, in those off years where we do not sell homes, any construction we are doing is on our balance sheet. It does not move to the income statement until we sell the homes, which essentially makes our ratios really out of whack, where overhead, both the fundraising and the GNA, can often appear as 40% in a given year because the construction is not recognized as programmatic cost until we sell the homes. So when we were talking about doing this webinar, there was some concern amongst the management team. Well, what will people think if they see that we're a three-star rating? And I think like others on the phone, it's a challenge where the ratings are the ratings. You play along, should you play along, etc. But it's something we wrestle with. So I'm going to briefly share what lessons we have learned along the way with regard to talking differently about our costs. The first one being that we find that talking about full costs in full context is greater than what I call buckets without cost, without context, excuse me. So what do I mean by that? So in our region, the most common question is how much is your cost to build? And when you have to share that it's several hundred thousand dollars per unit, that is an enormous sticker shock even for us. And so wherever we are talking about costs, we always couple it with what is the need, what trends are we seeing in the market as a whole, because there are so many external variables over which we do not have control, like subcontracting costs and material costs, and then what stories can we tell about the homeowners in ways that are grounded in data as well as narrative. So we've invested considerably in the last couple of years in our impact measurement function so we can talk about the BA acquisition rates for kids who grew up in Habitat homes, for example, is over 40% where for their parents it's 23% and being able to really dig into what are the types of outcomes we get to see from the homeowners we work with. 
And this is much greater and better than focusing on, you, this could be a pie chart, it could be the buckets, how do we spend our money? Well, you know, X percent goes to program and isn't that great, et cetera. I have never in my three and a half years at Habitat Greater San Francisco ever seen us use a pie chart with a donor in conversation. So, no buckets, uh, big X through the buckets or through your pie chart or what have you. The second lesson we've learned is, I suspect, um, hard fought and challenging for a lot of you guys on the phone. I suspect you've also had to do this, and that is know when to walk away. So this is particularly relevant for our public subsidies that we receive typically per unit that we work on, uh, per home unit that we work on. So when you have, let's say, 30 homes in a development and you're able to get $50,000 in subsidy per door, per unit, that's pretty good. Your compliance costs are going to be high, but you're spreading them across a number of units, and that $50,000 as a percentage of your total unit cost is significant enough to make all of the compliance and reporting worth it, even though we don't have any compliance staff that are dedicated to that function given our headcount and given the general distribution of our resources as an organization. When, however, as happened in our last development, that subsidy goes to $15,000 per door, for five homes, your compliance is still extreme. As a percentage of the total cost that you're getting back from that subsidy, it is much lower. And again, we don't have the compliance staff. So we have had to have some hard conversations with our donors and management about walking away from historical subsidies and having to sub supplement that with unrestricted donor dollars in order to make our projects pencil. But it's a conversation we have frequently and I think it lends us in the right place. The third lesson we have learned is good cost data just helps you make better decisions. So we, the first two lessons are both are primarily externally facing lessons. How do we interact with donors and our board, et cetera? These next couple lessons are more the internal side of really good cost data and the nuance that comes with it. So what you'll see on the screen here is an analysis that we did where we looked at the fully loaded, so all in, materials, direct, indirect, and straight overhead, costs associated with a series of different repairs and projects we did in our neighborhood revitalization programs. And you'll see there's variation in some places that the total cost really is different depending on what type of project that you're doing. And it helped us make much better decisions about, for example, in the case of the community facility, where there is money that the organization we partner with to do the facility, that there's money available they can bring to the table, and the reach is considerable, it's worth doing these higher cost projects. In the middle, the realization that large home repairs, for example, we're having a lot of variation and we need to standardize the scope to reach the efficiencies that we wanted. And on the far right, that where we do park beautification and improvement work, the full cost is very low. We see really high returns in terms of our quarterly scores for the parks that we work in vis-a-vis -vis other San Francisco parks, and we can host a lot of volunteers. So this helped shape our decisions around the portfolio of work. Similarly, the analysis that we've done internally on the fully loaded cost stack and really trying to nuance the difference between the direct cost of operating a program, the indirect cost that can be allocated to the program but is indirect, things like investments in data and measurement, which has been considerable for us in order to quantify and qualify our outcomes, and then distinguishing that from critical overhead that we deeply value that is different in terms of how it builds the cost stack. And then finally, this lesson that I'm sure many of you live every day, that the full costs of doing the work are always in flux. And so one of the things that I have found frustrating is being asked the question, well, what is your cost to do your, let's say, critical home repairs? And the question is when. I can tell you what it was 18 months ago. I can tell you what it is now. But I can also tell you that we're doubling the size of the program in terms of counts of projects without doubling the size of the staff, which takes down your fully loaded cost. And so just being really mindful of the nuances and how to describe what the costs say and what they don't say and why 
it's been really critical for us to communicate better about the mission uh, here at Habitat Greater San Francisco. So I will wrap it up there and turn it back over to Jacob. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anne. Um, you know, just if, if more nonprofits were able to provide the kind of sophistication that you just showed us, um, I think we wouldn't be having this problem at all. Um, but I guess the one question I have for you is you mentioned your board. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned how they were really pushing on your Charity Navigator rating. Can you say a little bit more about what those board level conversations have been like and the degree to which your board understands the actual underlying economics that you just explained to us? So I would say we're a 22-person board. A good half of the board members at least several times over the course of our board meetings in a year bring it up. And every time they bring it up, we share a couple of things consistent with what I just shared um, in terms of the, the economics of it. I think our finance committee very much gets it. I would say our real estate committee very much gets it. Across the rest of the board, there's nuance in the, the economics and what's moving from a balance sheet to an income statement that I think for some people, to be candid, they hear it as, is that just an excuse? And it's frustrating, honestly. Um, that's at only a handful of board members, but it can take up a lot of space in a room where I think we should be talking about different things. So we have been really trying to focus on there will always be this ebb and flow. So my slide right now is appropriate for that with the bumpy road. And if you look at our fiscal 18 financials, they're going to look amazing. But they may look amazing in the four-star rating and the quote-unquote low overhead but we will not celebrate that because if we celebrate that, it makes it much harder the subsequent year when the numbers look different. That's, that's really powerful and, and we really do have to, I think, think through the emotional experience of someone like a board member um, and what it really takes to help them understand um, what really needs to be celebrated and what shouldn't be celebrated um, and um, and how to respond to that perception of an excuse when it's really a well-reasoned explanation. Um, great. Thank you, Anne. Well, with that, let's hand it over to Dominique um, to talk a bit about the experience at Congresso. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, let me say that I'm really excited about this dialogue, and I look forward to many more conversations. Um, I am a CPA turned social worker, turned into the CFO of a $24 million nonprofit that is almost 80% government funded. Um, our agency is called Congreso de Latinos Unidos. We are headquartered in Eastern North Philadelphia, and we are a multi-service organization serving 17,000 unduplicated individuals in a meaningful way through health, education, workforce, and family and housing services. Um, I truly believe there's a dire need for more f fiscal sophistication in the nonprofit industry, and so I share with you now just a few stories of how we are managing, quote unquote. And I put managing in quotations because I think that's so often what we as nonprofits can only do. So first to talk about managing overhead expectations and dealing with government contracts. Um, just quick context, we here do not have direct federal dollars, but we uh, do have a lot of pass-through through the state and the city uh, dollars. So about a, a year or so ago, uh, we were entering uh, budgeting season here internally, and I was sitting with programmatic staff asking them about each contract within their division and trying to understand the fiscal limitation. So for example, why does this contract that serves such a high-risk population not allow insurance costs? Wouldn't they want us to have insurance? Or why is this housing contract uh, with, that has so much administrative work giving us less than a 5% indirect rate? Uh, the questions were many, and what I learned was that we had been accustomed to doing it this way because that is what someone on the funder end had told us at some point in time. Well, I wanted to prove it. So I methodically um, you know, reviewed each of our contracts and our budgets and got in touch with each of our contract funders over the course of a month. And I asked them specifically about limitations and disallowed costs and why the end rate, rate was X for this particular contract. And I asked them specifically to show me the regs to back up the decision. If there were none, then explain the rationale to me. 
Um, and it was an eye-opening experience. Um, I learned in some cases that we share our admin portion with the government intermediary disproportionately, and that's why the rate is embarrassingly low, uh, because their operational costs need to be taken care of first. Um, I learned to better understand the regs of many of our super particular contracts, and yes, indeed, some allow insurance and others do not. Um, and there were a few wins. Um, for example, I questioned um, this rate that we historically had under 10% for a series of contracts. And when I asked the funder why we weren't at least at 10%, he, he said, well, I guess I can give you the 10%. I mean, victory. Uh, it made the whole exercise worth it to see even some movement. What did I learn from this experience? I mean, first is for me to take a fresh look at our budgets every year. I mean, regs are constantly changing. People are constantly changing. Interpretations are constantly changing. And it's so important to take that time. It takes a lot of time, but it's really worth it. Um, next, next, to ask questions. I learned, you know, really understand the supporting regs. I mean, I know that sounds silly, and they're, you know, if there's funders on the line that say, of course you should be understanding them. Uh, yes, but really from this lens, holistically, um, to keep to have um, a holistic lens, a fiscal lens, to really understand the decisions regarding indirect and disallowed, and ensure they're being followed appropriately on both ends. And lastly, don't be afraid to ask for more, especially when we're, you're getting so little, perhaps, in some cases. Um, you just don't know what, what discretion is out there to be able to, to put in a line item that would make sense. So switching gears um, and talking about what questions to ask when considering whether to accept funding with challenging overhead applications. Um, implications, rather. So we're a multi-service organization, right? So it can be argued that everything fits into our mission. Um, one of my goals is to map our portfolio of programs visually to show which meet margin and, um, and which don't. And this thinking is inspired by a Bridgespan article um, where they showed a quadrant about mission versus margin. And really what I want to figure out a way to do is how do I visually present inf information so program staff can view decisions through the fiscal lens. It's a nut that I'm still trying to crack. Um, for me, at a basic level, if a contract meets our agency standard indirect rate, covers STE costs, and is not losing money, if it's performance-based, then it meets margin. Um, we, however, have a web of programs that depend on each other to fully fund some positions, and sometimes opportunities arise for new funding that have low indirect but mirror existing funding. And so program staff don't understand, well, why can't we take on more of these contracts? It's exactly like the contract we have now. Um, but there are financial losers, and, and it really means digging a deeper hole for ourselves as a nonprofit. You know, about three years ago, our agency applied for a multi-million dollar workforce development contract. It was a funding stream we had had about a decade before. We still had some experience with it on a very small um, level. Um, and we knew that this stream of money was slow paying, that the indirect was capped at 10%, and that it required a lots of cumbersome administration in submitting documentation for every penny spent. And it was performance-based. So you can imagine my hesitancy from a CFO perspective in applying for this stream, but nonetheless, as an agency, we decided to pursue it. Well, we were awarded the, um, the contract, and at that point, we paused and we took a moment to really ask ourselves, you know, what will the startup of this contract do to our cash flow? Do we have the cash to front? Do we understand the true startup cost? Can we afford to run such a large program at a deficit from the beginning, given the low indirect rate, that you'll never really catch up until the contract ends? Is it worth it? Meaning, is it so critical that we do it that no one else can for us to take this financial hit? And that's a whole other webinar in itself. In the end, we opted not to take this award, which is a politically brave move, and applauded discreetly by some providers. We talked internally about how for every contract we could say no to, the reality is that there are a line of other nonprofits waiting to be asked to take it and who will say yes. But that yet those invoice payments won't come any faster for them and the indirect rate wouldn't be any higher. And so we are competing in the nonprofit industry for losing contracts. We are competing for losing contracts. This past year, I drafted an internal policy for program leadership to follow if they wanted to pursue a funding opportunity for less than $25,000. They had to prove it was worth it to apply. Now, you may think $25,000, that sounds like a nice chunk of change. 
It is, believe me. We are grateful for every $20, $25,000 we get. For any funders on the line, thank you. Um, but if you have multiple contracts under $25,000 that pay low overhead and require as much administrative work and reporting as a $300,000 contract, not so much. You know, in discussing this internal policy, there was pushback from programs who pieced together many of these tiny, tiny grants to sustain a service or a program. And so through this the development of this policy, we're asking ourselves questions such as, does it cost more to administer the grant than it's worth? And we're still stuck on answering these questions when it's not simply a fiscal equation, but you look at client needs, et cetera. We ask ourselves, does it subsidize an existing program? That may be a reason to go for it if the admin burden is low, because it's keeping another program alive. You know, I've heard David Hunter use the term strategic opportunist. And that means chasing the money just to stay in business. And I fear that sometimes that's what some of these opportunities feel like. Another quick story for you. Um, last year, the state of Pennsylvania had a budget impasse that lasted over seven months. Um, now remember, we are an agency that's almost 80% government funded. As a result of this impasse, monies were not flowing to social service providers. Um, nonprofits like ours are still feeling the effects of, of bouncing back from that over a year later, but that's the subject of another webinar as well. Anyway, we immediately went into advocacy mode to legislators in our state capital of Harrisburg. And what we did was I, we quantified um, how much on a daily basis earned contractual money was not being paid to us. And we kept a daily running total. For a while, we actually sent daily faxes out there to our reps um, for that to show the increasing deficit we had due to lack of payments. And then we settled on a weekly update, notifying our reps of how that total was, was increasing. Our CEO made trips out to Harrisburg, and we really advocated strongly to get a budget. Um, when we spoke to other providers, however, we learned that many were afraid to speak up for fear of retribution by their government funders. We really felt justified in our advocating for payment of our expenses. And we also were really confident in our relationships with our multiple funders to still take a stand. Now, if we were a small organization with one major funding stream, perhaps we would have felt differently. But why is it that we as nonprofits lack voice so often and just take what we're given? Be it a subpar indirect rate, or a massive new contract that won't pay us for over 90 days, or a delay in processing of annual renewal contracts or budgets while we stand by and continue quietly to serve those in need while fronting significant cash. These are the questions we face on a daily basis. Nonprofit Quarterly held a webinar, a webinar with Claire Knowlton back in September on nonprofit full costs. And in this webinar, they used an analogy which I love. Um, they said, is all funding equal? Do you want to drink fresh water, which nourishes the body and gives it substance to keep it healthy? Or do you want to drink salt water, which dries you out and depletes all your healthy resources? We as nonprofits are drinking too much salt water. I know the fresh water is limited. Believe me, we're always looking for it. But it's so important to know your costs. What is an adequate indirect rate on which you can end your year in the black? What contracts should you not even consider? And to Anne's slide, what should you be getting out of? Why are we competing for losing contracts? We are fighting over the salt water. And we, Congress, are guilty as well. But we as an industry are fighting over salt water. I don't have a solution. I'm just willing to share our experience and our struggles quite candidly, which occur even in a $24 million organization. And I'm willing to continue to ask the question. So I'm going to stop there and pose more questions than answers and let the next presenter, uh, Vu, take it from here. Um, great, Dominique. Thank you so much. I, I must say that that last metaphor has made me thirsty. And I think we all in the field are, are thirsty for resources that can really allow us to accelerate and not get stuck and dried out. Uh, we have one question directly to you from um, Leon Pernala. Um, they ask, does asking funders to show the regs or pushing back on, the, on overhead make it more difficult to get funding the next year? No, absolutely not. I mean, a piece of it was me, you know, me playing new girl to a degree, but also set me saying, listen, I want to be sure we're in complete compliance, right? How does this work? Let me understand what you're thinking and sort of pushing back. And honestly, the reality, in some cases, it's a lot of non-accountants that are um, non-fiscal, fiscally trained folks that are making these decisions. And so in some cases, it took a lot of time for people to get back to me. So it wasn't, I think the approach is very important, right, and to come at it 
the, as a, in a collaborative way. But the re and, and, and it wasn't so much that I was like, ha, huh, I want to catch you doing something. But, um, but the reality is there is a lack of understanding, sometimes even on the funder side. Believe me, we have very sophisticated funders, and we're very grateful for, our, for the partnerships we have. But I think the, how, how you approach it makes, makes all the difference. And there's not one person that said, Oh, because you asked this, or because you're questioning this, you're not you're not going to do it. Because we still had to be held to the contract deliverables. We still get audited. We still have to main, maintain relationships throughout the year. I think you know, back to my point. It's so important not to be afraid to ask the questions. I I, I love that, and I feel like that builds um, credibility in two ways. One, just for showing that you're a truth teller, that you're willing to stand up for what you believe to be right. But also for those who aren't trained in economics or accounting or finance, you become a teacher and you just help them understand. And when someone leaves the situation with better understanding, I've certainly found in my own experience that they tend to be very grateful for that. Um, great. Thank you, Dominique. With that, let's hand it over to our third and final speaker, Vu, and then after Vu is done, we'll have a broader discussion. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I got about four and a half hours of sleep last night because of my one-year-old. And also, overhead tends to trigger me a bit. So I'm trying to contain my rage and not you know, stab someone with a pen that I got from a conference or something. Um, but just real quick, I, uh, my, my work at Rainier Valley Corps, we are trying to really get organizations led by communities of color to develop their uh, capacity and, and work together to fight systemic injustice. And so we, we've been sending in fellows to these organizations. Uh, moving forward, we are expanding our mission to include just operating support as well as aggregating funding so that they don't waste so much of their time doing grant writing and, and other things, and so they can focus their time on, on really important things that we need them to do. Uh, I've been listening to this and I've been thinking about overhead and, and I feel like there's a few arguments that we need to make, especially in light of this political climate. I, I think that this conversation on overhead needs to include elements of equity and social justice here. So I don't have a sophisticated slide, my apologies, it's just pictures of baby animals, there's just a few of them. But. Uh, a couple of arguments that we need to make. One is that overhead is, first of all, is just really demoralizing. We're talking about people burning out in the sector. We have so much turnover and people are leaving the field. A lot of people who are executive directors of color have, are, are leaving the sector. And I think a lot of it is because we force our leaders in the sector to justify the work and not allow them to spend enough of their time actually doing the work that they're passionate about, that they know is necessary. I remember one time when I spent 15 hours trying to break down on a financial report of a grant that we had just received. They wanted to know every single line item and, and how much we spent of each line item using their funds. So I remember just calculating because they, did, they had different uh, categories of the expenses. They did not align with our, our chart of accounts. And so we have to convert everything to their line item uh, chart of account. And then we have to figure out of each of those line items, how much was being spent, and then how much the indirect rate was, et cetera. And I remember we spent, I don't know, $826 on supplies or something. And they need to know exactly how much of that was spent by the, the funding that we got. And of course, it took me hours and hours doing this using macros and Excel formulas and everything. And I remember this is probably one of the few times in my career where I thought about quitting the nonprofit sector. I think that if we don't understand that it's demoralizing because it it just it's symbolic of the lack of trust that nonprofits have. I wrote about how so we tend to treat nonprofits the way the society treats poor people. And, and we don't trust we don't trust people to handle funding. We don't trust you know, people on welfare to be using their food stamps. And so we say, well, you can't use your food stamps a certain way. You can't buy Cheetos or whatever. And it's the same thing with nonprofits. Like, okay, we'll give you money, but we don't actually trust that you can actually spend your money because you probably spend on stupid things like staff salaries and benefits and crap like that. And I think this has been causing a lot of burnout and people to leave the sector. But there are a couple more 
important um, things that we have to, to think about that this is inequitable. I think that focusing on, on overhead is leaving out a lot of people and communities that, that are marginalized. We know that many of organizations that are smaller, that are grassroots, tend to be led by communities of color and other marginalized communities. They are not going to have a CFO who can, or a bookkeeper or uh, who, whoever to actually sit down and spend hours dissecting where money is being spent. And they also tend to have higher overhead because if you are the only staff, you're, you're, the, you're the executive director, and you don't have any other expenses you know, because you're trying to get more funding, then it's going to look like you have huge overhead when really it's just you trying to do your best to do everything else and responding to your community's needs. So we have to really understand that this is, this is something that is, that is extremely inequitable um, for marginalized communities. It's not just a, a nice to, to have, you know, to, to not focus on overhead anymore. It is, I think my, my last argument is that I think it actually perpetuates injustice here. Um, sorry. It's perpetuating injustice. I use the, the metaphor that you know we have uh, like a, a bakery, and it's you know people are coming in and saying, "Hey, I want to make sure that I I'm spending I, that I, I want to buy this cake, but you can't spend my money on eggs and butter or whatever. I don't want any of this money to be used to to to, uh, to pay for the electricity in your for your oven because that does not directly benefit people. That's that's actually overhead." But I think that we need a stronger metaphor. So I'm, I think that it's more like we nonprofits are firefighters, and we're trying to put out fires. And I think with this, uh, with the political climate, there's been a lot of fires that are out there, and our communities have been um, hurting a lot. And a lot of funders and donors are saying, "Hey, uh, I want to make sure that you're actually using my money on the water and not the." the hose put out the fires because that's actually overhead and I, I don't want you to spend all my money on, on overhead. Well, I think if we keep doing this, then we spend, we, we focus attention and time away from people actually trying to put out the fires and then the fires will start spreading. We're wasting so much time of nonprofits just trying to figure out what is overhead, what is indirect. We're spending millions of hours every year trying to figure this stuff out. And then we cannot focus that time on fighting injustice, and that that allows the that allows it to perpetuate. And I, I think there's this element that I, I think focusing on overhead is actually perpetuating injustice because it allows us it's 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 wasting our time and our energy that we should be using out there building our community and serving our our, our people. So I don't think it's it's longer it's it's any longer a uh, you know it's it's really nice if you if you increase your indirect uh, allowance for nonprofits I think if you don't do that if you restrict nonprofits ability to do things and you focus on overhead then you are allowing injustice to proliferate so I think I'll, I'll end there. Great, thank you, thank you, Vu. Um, so I guess I'll let me start with a question, then I'm going to go to some from the audience for the entire group, but so Vu, when you've had these conversations with funders, what approach has worked best for you? Has it been the use of metaphors, like your great firefighter metaphor, or a moral call, like the equity analysis, or a more tactical financial analysis? What, what actually seems to work to convince funders that this is not the right thing to pay attention to and they need to look at, at actual mission and results? I don't think we've had much of a, uh, we haven't really used the social justice and equity, diversity, and inclusion lens when we're talking about overhead. Right now, everyone is talking about D, DEI. And I think this, I think we have a good case to make re regarding this. Um, if funders tend to pay a little bit more attention, I think, to their credit when we say, look, in uh, communities, that are marginalized are, are being affected by your policies. You're leaving out communities of color, you're leaving out communities of disabilities, you're leaving out LGBTQ communities. Many of these marginalized communities tend to be smaller and so they will have bigger overhead. And I think we need to make a stronger argument around that. I don't think we have been doing uh, that enough. Uh, 
Um, great. And actually, I want to ask essentially the same question to Anne and Dominique. Of what, what particular messages, we've gotten this question from several members of the audience, what particular messages have you found most effective when talking to people about, about this issue? And I'll let you go first. So I, I would say that we, our fund development group, our fund development team, um, does a really good job on the front end of screening grants and grant applications and understanding on the front end before we apply for them what the terms are, to what extent there are restrictions, what those restrictions look like. So what we have found helpful is in advance of applying for a grant, using that as an opportunity to build a relationship with that foundation or that donor and ask some of the questions about their restrictions kind of as, even if they've been a historical funder, to use Dominique's phrase, the new kid or the, we're just wondering why or could you please explain. And we have found some more flexibility than might otherwise be apparent when we've done that. Um, since I'm not on the development team, it's harder for me to answer the, once we're locked into a grant, what is that? dance look like exactly. So Dominique, maybe I'm able to answer that better than I. No, I agree with everything you said. I think it's really understanding it before you go into it. And then there's, you know, some things you've been stuck with forever. But I would even say the precursor to that, and if I'm not answering the question, then call me on that, Jacob. But the precursor to that is really understanding what your costs are and, and, and learning to be proactive um, fiscally, right? So it's just back to the need for more sophistication. I think you can't understand how big of a hole you continue to deep, you know, you you continue to dig if you don't understand like what is in your portfolio. So back to even before you're out there having the conversations, maybe don't even go out of the conversations and spend some time with some of these folks if it's not even going to be worth it. And I just think sometimes we're just we're just chasing our tail. So um, I'll stop there. So, and here's a question for, for any of you, and, and feel free to jump in, and if you talk over each other, it will just be a sign that we're all passionate about this. Um, but there are a couple of questions about that admit that there are cases out there of malfeasance in the nonprofit sector. There are some scoundrels. Um, the press often focused on those issues. Um, does anyone have any comment on that? Um, and how do we counter those rare cases which have created this framework um, to focus back on the vast majority of nonprofits where there's very responsible use of funds. So I respect to all of us have very strong feelings about this, so I'll be the first to voice my strong feelings about it. So there are a couple of things there. The first is back to Vu's point about trust. You know, the question that I have when these things get raised is, what is your level of trust in us? What is your level of trust in our mission? What is your level of trust in our leadership? And I would, I'm speaking, um, th this has not happened to me, and to my knowledge, it hasn't happened much here at Habitat, if at all. But I do think that kind of, wait, let's go back to trust. I understand that there are bad eggs out there, but we are not one of those eggs. We believe we have strong policies, practices, et cetera. The second is, there are bad eggs everywhere. This is not a nonprofit thing. There are bad eggs in business. There are bad individual actors. There are bad politicians. And to the extent that we are structuring our policies and practices to overly correct for that malfeasance, we get ourselves into trouble. And my third point is, all of that said, we do need to have, and I think there are a number of things in place in the sector, trying to put policies and practices and norms into place, financial controls, accepted accounting principles, et cetera, et cetera, that are already set up to hedge against or, or stop or deter that kind of malfeasance. So, you know, from a policy or administrative grants administration perspective, I think there are some good questions to ask about weeding some of that out, but it is so rare as compared to the sector as a whole, it just makes me very angry. My palms are sweating. I'm very angry right now. <laughs> and, and I'll just add, so yesterday, um, this is Jacob, I, I was at the Federal Trade Commission for a day-long conference hosted by the FTC with dozens of representatives from state um, attorneys general offices um, who are uh, in charge of rooting out those rare cases of fraud. Um, 
And you know that ultimately, it's the gov that's the government's responsibility. Um, and unfortunately, many of those offices are underfunded, um, and they're really um, it's scraping by in their own way. Um, but you know, we in the nonprofit sector need to empower those who are going after those again very rare cases, um, so that we are able to um, begin to build even deeper public trust. And I will also add, we need to remember that relative to other institutions in society, the nonprofit sector as a whole has a tremendous amount of trust. Now, there's been erosion of trust in almost all of our institutions, but we are doing far better than Congress or the corporate world, um, the church, uh, and so we need to recognize and own that we have, um, we have a lot of reputation capital with the public, um, and I think we need to spend some of it to help them understand um, the, the nature of our work. Um, here's a, just a broader question I have, and this came up in a couple of places, and it's basically around the confusion that we often see between the concept of overhead and accounting concept, and then the concept of salaries, money that goes to people. Um, can anyone just comment on that confusion um, and the the unique economics of the nonprofit sector that just really rely on people more than they rely on machines um, or other forms of capital, um, and how we help to justify to donors the costs that we bear, which are mostly costs of people. Uh, this is Dominique, so I'm not sure I, I, I'm answering the question, that's why I understand the question. I would, say, I would say, yeah, a huge part of our um, indirect or overhead rate are, is our admin staff. And so um, we have a very um, clear, methodical budgeting process to do internally. And um, if, you know, questioned on that, we, could, we can share that, you know, with funders if questioned or how, um, what's allowed and what's disallowed. Um, yeah, I don't see how you can not have people, you know, in the equation. Um, I think a piece of it, and I'm thinking back to your last question too as well, Jacob, but like I, I think it's one nonprofit at a time. We have to be encouraging good fiscal practices, more sophisticated fiscal practices, transparency, proactive reporting beyond just the requirement, um, transparency with boards. The board members are out there talking about the nonprofit in the community with partners, with your banks, with your lenders, et cetera. I, I just think that um, it, it, it's, it's not talked about. It's sort of a secret, and it feels like it feels, you know, it shouldn't feel dirty if we're putting the overhead in there. It should, we should be like, this is a valid cost, and this is what it takes. And one, one, um, one thing I've said to funders is, you know, our most valuable assets are our people. Like, that's how, that's how we keep the, the doors open, and that's how we keep providing the services, and those are the people that are cutting the checks and writing the grants and building the relationships. This is Anne. I would also add that that confusion about staffing as an overhead, staffing costs as an overhead cost, is pretty f widespread and uh, maybe doesn't go very deep, but I've heard it a lot from donors, um, but also from some nonprofit leaders. And I think the nuance is extremely important that the staff cost for a program director who is leading our home ownership development is a program cost unless she is spending time doing, say, a fundraising ask with our director of development, and in which case our uh, time reporting system catches that because we capture our actuals, not just our budgeted. Where do people allocate out? I think that distinction is incredibly important because the sector is largely driven by people cost, but that people cost I would say all of it is extremely important, but the programmatic cost you can put in to direct, let's say our director of measurement, is an indirect cost that you can allocate out to programs, and my position, for the most part, I spend most of my time on GNA, is a cost that is, is overhead, and I, that those distinctions really matter. And it's frustrating to feel like we can't have that there's so much confusion about definitions and so much misunderstanding that we can't get past each other to talk about the real value. I agree. Well said. And then to me that leads to a question of are we going to be able to correct the old bad conversation we've been having where there's all this confusion and um, all this misinterpretation, or are we able to skip to a totally new kind of conversation? Um, and my argument is that um, the best way to um, 
beat the overhead myth is to replace it with something better. Uh, instead of countering it directly, let's show the donating community, uh, the donating public, um, what our results are and, and show that in a dynamic and visual and compelling way um, and offer them an alternative um, that they feel is credible. So here's a question which I think I will direct to Vu. I'm going to quote it. This is from Scott Adams. Um, one way to engender trust in a nonprofit is through the financials, the point today. Another way is through accreditation. But I think Ms., uh, Mr. Lay's point about these kinds of institutional or external or objective reviews inherently hurts smaller non-majority nonprofits. So, Vu, do you think that's true? It, does accreditation need to hurt the smaller organizations that may, for example, represent communities of color, or is there a way to empower them through some kind of accreditation process? I think it really depends on what we're accrediting people on. You know, if we're focusing on outcomes and, and impact, there's just so many variables in, in this sector. And I think we have to be very careful about what we're actually measuring. What I've been seeing with all this data, this focus on data, has really been leaving out a lot of communities uh, that are marginalized. You know, we talk about data as, as like this objective thing that would allow nonprofits and funders to figure out where we would be spending our, our time and our energies most effectively. But again, we have this data resource paradox where it's basically you need money to get good data and you need good data to get money. So they're just kind of stuck in this uh, terrible cycle. I think this accreditation thing, if we're not careful, might fall into the same sort of cycle where, well, who is accrediting people? Do they have representation? Do they understand the communities that they are uh, reviewing? Um, because if we're not careful, then it's like it's, it's the same sort of things that are being perpetuated. Um, and yeah, and, and if, if these small organizations don't have the, the, the skills or the experience or even the time to play the game right, and to follow the rules or to build the relationships or to do whatever is needed to get a good uh, rating, then I think it's going to perpetuate the same sort of dynamics that, that we're seeing. All right, we've got two minutes left, so I just want to give each of our speakers a chance for a final comment or thought um, to, the, to the audience. Um, and let's go in the order of presentation. So Anne, what's your, what's your final thought? I'll just pick up using the recent bias on Vu's comment just a moment ago about specifically about the connection between this discussion on overhead and the critical investment in measurement and impact. I agree with Vu that not all things can fall into neat, nice data buckets. There are a lot of variables. And I believe that a lot of nonprofits deeply want to invest in quantifying and qualifying where they can and being clear about that but it takes investment. And often, and sadly, that falls into the, well, it's not really direct program, so no thanks bucket. Dominique? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, I would speak to the nonprofits, you know, on the call to say, please, please understand your costs, know your costs, look under the hood, clean up what needs to be cleaned up so that we can be part of this conversation in a credible way. And, uh, and be proactive and not reactive to the fires that happen so often in our world. Thank you. And Vu, last word to you. I would say that we have a sector of really nice people, nice, uh, and which is, which is really nice. And so we put up with a lot of crap. And overhead has been one of the crap things that we have been putting up with. And our sector is, has been nice, but I, I don't think in this sort of environment we can afford to be nice or our communities can afford for us to be nice any any further. This overhead thing is a red herring. It, it is not a thing. It should not be a thing anymore. We should be focusing on results and impacts, not who's paying for pencils and whether someone's paying 10% on rent and stuff versus what are they actually getting accomplished. And then I think we need to seg in the fact that so much of this conversation is leaving behind marginalized communities, we have to see how these types of uh, unrealistic expectations are affecting the communities that we're trying to serve. I think that's a perfect note, a moral call for all of us. Um, this is not a conversation about accounting. This is a conversation about right and wrong and about the society that we all want to live in. 
Um, and we've made great progress. We've got a long way to go. Thank you to our three excellent speakers, and thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Um, keep an eye out for um, a recording of this um, and the, the slides it's coming your way in the next 48 hours, and continued work from GuideStar and many others to try to transcend the overhead myth. Thanks a lot.